Okay, welcome back. Um, I will try to uh, make the second video lecture um, on our course CL202. Again, this is module six. So we'll try to finish up module six today and uh, hopefully go to the tutorial sheet number eight and try to solve some problems um, so that we can finish module six. You can try out these problems and uh, then we can start with the next module, which will be on hypothesis testing. So uh, let's go to our uh, desktop. So I'll minimize this. And uh, just as a quick recap, we have been seeing uh, how to do an interval estimation for uh, the two main parameters of interest, which were mean and variance of a population using samples, using finite number of samples that we have. Uh, so in the last class, let me see if I can pick up the pen or a pencil. Yeah. So in the last class, we finished these five interval estimates. Uh, so they were with, uh, five different cases. So these three were to do with a one population uh, uh, estimates, and these were for two populations. That is, that is, there were two different populations, and we were trying to estimate the difference of the means of the two populations. Of course, we have always assumed normality in all our work so far, um, which unless otherwise specified is a default uh, in this course. Now, we'll move to a different distribution, which is a binomial distribution. So if you'll recall the binomial distribution was concerned with finding out the probability of success, as we mostly called it, uh, when there were n Bernoulli trials. So you'll remember that in case of n Bernoulli variables, and I'll call them x1 um, and so on. And so x1 takes the value of 1 if it's a success, and it takes a value of 0 if it's a failure, and we said that the probability of success, that is the probability that x1 equals one, that is a success was achieved, is uh, denoted by p, or the probability of success. So this of course, oops, I forgot the one, is equal to the small p, as we've been calling it. Okay, so this is x1. Now, if there are n Bernoulli trials, so you have x1, x2 till xn, then the number of successes obtained in those n trials will be x1 plus x2 till xn. So every time you get a success, you're going to put a one there. So by writing this on this addition, you're actually counting the number of successes, okay? Now, an interesting situation is where you would like to have the probability um, or you would like to know what is the proportion of the success. So if I add all this up, okay, and call this as a sum total, so I'll call this as xt. So these are the number of successes that were obtained. Okay. Now, in it, uh, in uh, n trials, the the ratio of the number of successes to the total number of trials is called the proportion. Okay, and this is a variable which is of interest um, because you know, in some sense, it is actually telling you what is the value of this p over here it is the probability of success so you have n samples x1 to xn and you want to be able to estimate p so an obvious choice is you know find out this ratio and we will call this as the sample proportion okay so again the hat indicates that it comes from the sample and uh, it is 
um, it's it's an estimate or it is a statistic for an for estimating the true p which is underlying in that population okay so we really want to know what is that value of p and uh, one way of finding out that value of p is by conducting these bernoulli trials and then obtaining this statistic which i have called here as p hat okay so this is what we are going to talk about now you'll remember right in the beginning of this module uh, we talked about an example where we said that 75% uh, of all chemical engineering students like prefer a closed book exam to an open book exam. And we had said that the margin of error over there was 8.5%. So in this case, we would write it as 75%. So 75. Okay, I know it's a little clumsy because I'm using my keypad. And so I have 75 plus minus 8.5%. Okay. So this is how you see results reported, particularly during election time. Okay. When they do exit polls, they report two numbers. They report one number over here, which is 75. And then they report a margin of error, 8.5. And very often in those polls, you, they will also tell you what was the sample size, though many uh, pollsters try to suppress that number. Okay. Now, in this case, the 75 that we have is nothing but this number. Okay. It tells you the total number of successes divided by the total number of trials. So, for example, and these are Bernoulli trials, so you know that there's only two outcomes. So, the question could be, are you going to vote for an open book exam or a closed book exam? So if you have voted for an closed book exam, we will consider it as a success and we'll call, count that as one. So when you have all these counts over all the number of students that you have, you have sampled or you have polled over, then 75 gives you, so, so this would be 0.75, okay? Or written in terms of percentage would be 75. So you will realize that this p hat can only be a number between 0 and 1. And now we have to be able to understand how does this come about. So from what we have done so far, you already know this is related to the confidence interval. Okay. And that is what we will discuss in today's class. So let me go to that slide. There you go. Okay, so the first thing we should realize is that so far all the five cases that we discussed before had to do with uh, a binomial, with a normal distribution, and now we are moving away from a normal distribution. But you will see that we'll come back to a normal distribution. So we will consider, as we discussed, that the probability of success is p in a uh, binomial distribution okay so if there are n trials and you have x positive outcomes then the probability of x is so you, you should now realize that this x is really the sum over all those n trials then the this distribution has a mean of np and you can see, and you know we have done this very many uh, times in the class where we have written this as x1 to xn, and then we have run the expectation operator over each of those uh, independent random variables. So each of these trials are independent. So when we run these, uh, the expectation operator, you know that the probability, that the expectation of each of these variables is p, and so the total expectation of x which is x1 to x addition of x1 to xn becomes nothing but np. Similarly, you will recall that the uh, variance of each of these xi's was p into 1 minus p. And since these, va these variables are independent, the variances add up, and so it becomes n times p into 1 minus p. So you're well aware of this particular result. OK, now we do the switch, and we try to connect this to 
a normal distribution by claiming that and appealing to the central limit theorem that as n increases, the binomial variable x has a normal distribution with its mean being np, which you can see comes from here, and its variance being np into 1 minus p. So we will now stop using a binomial distribution and start um, approximating it using a normal distribution. So again, the standard trick, you subtract out the mean. Oops, sorry about that. You subtract out the mean and you divide it by the standard deviation. And then you know that that is the unit normal distribution. So this variable will therefore vary as the unit normal. So you subtract, so it becomes nx uh, minus np divided by the standard deviation, which is np into 1 minus p. Okay. Now, the moment you can uh, do that, uh, you already know that if you had a normal distribution with mean being mu and variance being sigma square, then uh, you could have written this uh, probability statement. So we've seen this in the last class. I hope none of you have any, any doubts about that. Um, I will hopefully do a doubt solving session um, and I will see how to do that. Uh, so please make sure that you have doubts you would like to um, discuss, you know, please do attend that session. So we know that you could always write a two-sided confidence interval using uh, with 100 into 1 minus alpha. And so this is the two sides. You remember that this will be Z of alpha by 2 by the definition of a quantile point and because this was symmetric this tended or this became equal to minus of z of alpha by 2 okay so now that i can think of this in terms of a normal distribution um, i will i know that mu is equal to np and the standard deviation is equal to the square root of np into 1 minus p and that gives me this statement. So I do algebraic manipulations. And with that, um, you know, I should be able to write it in this particular fashion. However, there is a problem. And the problem is that this P is an unknown and it has uh, now become a nonlinear equation. Since that is the case, we can replace P with p hat okay in the variance or the standard deviation term only so you can see that you, you know i can now i will write this as x minus np over divided by um, so this was a case where you will recall is the variance was known okay when we had used uh, this kind of a distribution that the variance was or the standard deviation was known. So in this case, the standard deviation is not known. And so we'll have to play a trick. And the trick we play is by using p hat as obtained the sample value over here instead of p. Okay, so we have we have replaced p and uh, so we have replaced p with p hat only in the standard deviation term. Having done that, I can now write this statement in this particular fashion, okay? And I will now be able to rearrange so that only P is in the middle and P hat has gone towards the either ends, okay? Which is in this end and in this end. So this, as I have claimed all along, is no longer a probability because P was a, is is a parameter which is not a deterministic uh, uh, which is not a stochastic parameter and so i get my uh, proportion interval as such so when we said that there is 75 percent with 8.5 percent margin of error then you can now connect this that this term over here is the margin of error whether wherever where else this the sample value that you got is that 75 percent so let's look at an example quickly. You have a sample of 100 transistors randomly chosen from a large batch to determine if they meet the standards. 
So now there are only two options. So each transistor you choose, you say it meets the standard or it doesn't meet the standard. So it is a, an example of a Bernoulli trial. And now you have 100 such variables and each transistor is chosen randomly. So you will make the assumption that each of these um, Bernoulli variables are have the you know they are independent to each other and so if 80 of them meet the standards then you want to be able to make an 95 percent confidence interval okay so you know that p hat is 80 out of 100 so p hat will be uh, that's not very good let me try to fix it p hat will be equal to 80 out of a hundred. Which is 0.8. And so you can see that there's a 0.8 here for p hat. Now you should remember that z of 0.025, this is 95%. So alpha by 2 will be 0.025. That value is 1.96. And then you put in these values over here. So you get this number of 0.72. Uh, 2.88 that is a confidence interval or you would say that the uh, the proportion uh, the of uh, of those transistors that meet the standards is 80 percent plus minus 8 percent okay so it goes from 72 to 88 now just like in case of a um, in, in that case one, where we try to ask ourselves the question that can you tell me what should be the size, or what should be the sample size n, okay, what should be n, so that the size of the confidence interval, so this will be p hat, okay, that will be 80% in the last example, and from this end was 72 in the previous example, and so it was plus minus 8% and this was 88%. Okay, so this 88 minus 72 is the range of that interval. So in this case, it is 16% points is the range of that interval. You might have reasons to be able to report an, uh, a proportion estimate where the range of that interval is much smaller. Okay, so if so, that is the width of the interval, what I have been calling as the range. And let us say if that width is a desired number B, then a corresponding question is how many samples should I have so that my B is of a desired number? So let's say I did not want it 16%, I wanted it to be only 10%. Okay, then how many transistors would I need to check? Now, as you can imagine, you wanted more accurate information, means the number of samples have to go up, and that is precisely what, what happens in this particular case. So, if you rearrange this and write it in terms of n, then you can show that n will equal this. Okay. Now, um, um, you can you can further show that that number can that this is an upper bound okay for on n um, so one way that you should be able to uh, you should be able to rationalize this is by noting that the maximum value of p hat into 1 minus p hat is 1 fourth. Okay. So think about it. The maximum value of p hat, p is the ratio, is the probability of success. This can take a value only of up to 1 fourth. Okay. And so if you want uh, a bound on n, then um, you can show that the number of samples uh, should be uh, greater than this particular number okay so that will give you a bound 
for the number of samples so that the desired length of that uncertainty is uh, b okay i think that was the last slide and so i have finished it um, you can so um, again you can go through this uh, in greater detail and uh, make sure that you are able to you know in most cases just using a pen and paper derive many of these quantities uh, for example how do you get an upper bound over here uh, how do you get uh, f uh, this proportion for the most case if you just draw something like this and you start deriving you can come up with these numbers without having to uh, remember all of them so that was the uh, was case 6 uh, so with this, we have finished uh, chapter seven of Ross. And uh, what I will attempt to do at this point is um, is probably um, solve some of these problems from the tutorial problems um, from the book. So I hope uh, you all have this book. Uh, probability and statistics for engineers and scientists we have only put up the problem numbers on moodle which you should attempt uh, these problem numbers are given on moodle so let me go to i don't see it open but there you go it is tutorial 8 And these were those problem statements, okay? So I'll have to figure out a way of how to do this through a video lecture. Uh, what I will probably do is uh, look at the problem and um, read it out from the book. Then we can go to our, um, our uh, the lecture notes, which you have, and discuss that with respect to the lecture notes. Uh, if possible, I'll try to solve it. Um, I have solved problem number seven and problem number 36 uh, using R and those codes have been uploaded. The problem number seven code is also over here. Okay, problem number 36 I have not included here, but the R file is uploaded on Moodle. Uh, so let's look at some of these problems. So I'm going to start with problem number one. Okay, and I have this really rudimentary board behind me and I'll try to use that to the extent uh, I can. So, let me start with problem number one. I hope the board is visible to you because I'm going to make use of it extensively now for the rest of this class. Let me see if I can that seems reasonable and I hope voice is not going to be a problem this time I'm using a, a, a headset so um, I'm going to read out problem number one so let me see if I can write down something where is my hey okay okay so it says, let x1 to xn be a sample from a distribution. So I think I'll just stand up. Okay, so it says x1 to xn uh, are samples from a distribution whose, uh, so these are i, i, d and f of x, i. Uh, is given as e to the power of minus x minus theta. I hope that is visible. There's a bracket here. When x is greater than or equal to theta and is zero otherwise. Okay. Now, uh, you have to determine the maximum likelihood estimator of theta. So I've discussed this in the class, the maximum likelihood estimation estimator of theta 
is an extremely, um, you know, there are those three steps that I've always discussed with you. The first step was to write the joint density. So first step is the joint density. In this case, because these are independent and identically distributed, you can write f of x1 to xn as the product of all of these. And so this will be, um, so I should put an i here to be accurate. So it will be, and when I multiply them out, the exponents will add up. So it is going to be uh, e to the power of minus summation of xi minus theta over all the i's, i going from 1 to n. Um, and here, of course, I will have that x1 is greater than or equal to theta till xn is greater than or equal to theta, or it will be a 0 else. Note that uh, to be this, all these inequalities can be represented very simply by saying that um, uh, theta is less than the minimum of x1 to xn. So I can say theta is less than or equal to the minimum of x1 to xn. Okay, that's another way of writing it. All right, so you have your joint density. What was the second step? The second step was to find the likelihood function. So if you write down the likelihood, and I had said that the likelihood function is nothing but with the, with the uh, uh, so I had written it like this. Uh, I'll need this. Uh, that's not very good. I hope it's okay. So I had written it like this. In this case, it would be L of theta given x1. Um, and x1 is equal to its realization. So I had to use the notation that you have x1 is equal to x1 star, x2 is equal to x2 star, and so on. So this will become simply the same, uh, the same uh, uh, function with xi re replaced with xi star, the numerical value. Okay, because these have now been, so given x1 is equal to x1 star and so on. So I'll just skip writing that. Now, the third step was to find the maximum of this function. That is the maximum likelihood estimate. So in this case, I can see that there's an exponent. So instead of taking the maximum of the likelihood function, I'll take the maximum of the log likelihood function. And so what I have, I will do is find the log of the likelihood function, okay? And that will essentially become, so I'll take the, um, uh, it'll be minus summation of xi minus theta i going from 1 to n when theta is less than the uh, minimum of x1 to xn okay and is zero else okay so i come to my third step which is finding a max and how do i find a max i can find a max by taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0 so i should take the gradient of ln l of theta with respect to theta set it equal to zero, okay? And that will give you your maximum likelihood estimate. Now, in this case, you will note that it is already linear in theta. So when you take the derivative with respect to theta, there is no more theta in the remaining equation, okay? So a simpler way probably to do this would be to uh, calculate, um, just look at it graphically, okay? And I'll see if I can, I'll do this graphically. This is now. Let me see if I have a piece of cloth which might be more effective.
okay so the first thing i if i want to draw this graphically i will look at this and i will rewrite it as l of theta is equal to uh, so the summation of xi minus n times theta now because these are numerical values this is a fixed number so this is a linear equation it is like y is equal to mx plus c it's a linear equation only thing that this equation works only for this domain and what happens after we pass this domain it becomes zero okay so if i were to draw this it would look something like this after i have all my realizations from x1 to xn i will plot find that minimum value of x1 star to xn star and draw this equation of this line y is equal to mx plus c when theta is less than this so whatever be so this is that threshold so i will draw that straight line okay and um, so i i have to uh, correct myself because there was a negative sign here this becomes minus and this becomes plus so that the slope is positive if i had not made that correction the slope should have been negative so i've corrected myself so it's a positive slope and this becomes zero after that so this is your likelihood function l of theta versus theta okay um, yeah it's a little the tube light is making it a little there's a little shine over here i'll just write this over here maybe it'll be more clearer i've written l of theta is equal to n theta minus summation of xi star and that is what i have plotted over here so the question is what is the maximum and the answer is of course the maximum is nothing but the minimum value of x1 star to xn star so i'll say theta hat maximum likelihood estimate based on n samples is equal to the minimum of x1 um, x1 to xn okay now if i write it like an, as an estimator and not an estimate then i will put the random vari variable over here okay so this is an estimator if i were to put in actual values in it and give you a numerical value then it will become an estimate okay so i'll write it as an estimator for now so we've always been calling random variables as, as uh, capital so by that virtue i should put this also as a capital theta so that is how you would calculate your maximum likelihood estimate now uh, let me look at the next problem so the next problem is problem number three uh, you have okay the problem number three is extremely straightforward and i think we have done this in the class so i'm not going to venture to do it it essentially tells you that given a normal distribution okay i think there are many scratches and so it doesn't clean properly so um, problem three is uh, let x1 to xn be a sample from a normal uh, population with the mean being mu and variance being sigma square determine the mle of sigma square when mu is known okay so this is an interesting problem problem number three it says this time x1 to xn belong to a normal population with mean mu and variance being sigma square now in the class uh, or in your notes we have found out a maximum likelihood estimator for mu and sigma okay and we had noted that mu maximum likelihood is equal to 1 by n times summation of xi random variable capital xi okay over all i's and we had found that uh, sigma square hat 
maximum likelihood estimate was 1 over n times uh, the summation of x i minus mu maximum likelihood the whole square and we had made a point we had said that see the maximum likelihood estimator so recall that the sample variance is 1 over n minus 1 times summation of x i minus x bar incidentally x bar and these are same okay the sample mean the maximum likelihood estimate of the population mean and this is the sample variance and the maximum likelihood estimate of the population variance so while the, these two were same these two are different and we have shown that the expected value of s square was sigma square so this is something we had shown in the class so that is very nice because it tells you that while s square has and you remember has a chi square distribution okay so you remember that n minus 1 into uh, s square by sigma square had a chi square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom um, at least the mean value of that distribution so if i were to plot it it would be uh, something related to chi square with a skew so at least it tells you that the expected value of s square is equal to sigma square okay and that was very good to know uh, however we had seen that in case of the maximum likelihood estimate uh, that is not the case that the expected value of sigma hat square ml was not equal to sigma square okay and we had made an argument saying that uh, we gave away one degree of freedom over here and so uh, this became a biased estimator so expected value of sigma hat square is not equal to sigma square okay in fact uh, i think it we had shown it is n uh, um, n uh, so so you should be able to show this uh, if you divide it by n and you multiply uh, it by n uh, then it will become n over n minus 1 into uh, sigma square which is not equal to sigma square except in the in the limiting case when n tends to infinity and we said so it has um, nice large sample properties but not so nice small sample properties okay so this problem is trying to explore a situation where uh, you have a um, mu is already known so you don't have to estimate this the true population mean is already known to you and if the true population mean is known to you then what effect does it have on this okay so when you write down your likelihood function so again you will do those three steps step one will be the joint density okay step two will be to find the likelihood function and step three will be then and of course the long the log of likelihood and step three will be to find only del by del sigma square and equate it to zero and why is that it is because uh, it is only this particular am i visible okay come that's not very nice okay uh, uh, that is because uh, mu is known so you don't have to do del by del mu okay when you do this you should uh, you know you should be able to calculate this and then they want you to find out the case when of the expected value of sigma hat square when mu is already known okay so you assume that the mu is a known value so you don't have to be you don't have to estimate this in this case you should be able to show that the expected value of sigma hat square when mu is known turns out to be sigma square okay so i will um, i will uh, urge you to do this particular problem it's an interesting problem and try to compare it with 
our original derivation of the expected value of sigma square uh, using maximum likelihood when we um, uh, when we did not assume that mu is known so you'll come to you'll see the difference so the difference is really that when mu is known the maximum likelihood estimate uh, derivation will give you an estimator whose uh, mean is unbiased or it's an unbiased estimator whereas when mu was not known it became biased so this is what it had turned out to be before okay when mu was not known here when mu is known so i'll urge you to 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 try this out okay so that was problem number 3 um, let's look at problem number 5 now okay this is another problem on maximum likelihood estimation uh, so maybe i will just discuss this with you all right so problem number 5 is an interesting problem it says that suppose that x1 to xn are normal with mean mu1 y1 to yn so there is one population which is x1 to xn which is normal with mean mu then you have y1 to yn are normal with mean oh with mean mu1 okay uh, y1 to yn are also normal so you can say it has uh, it is also a normal distribution but it has a mean mu2 so they are not identically distributed okay one is a different normal the other is a different normal so if i were to look like this this could be mu1 so x are distributed as per this and i don't so the variance we'll see later uh, the y's are distributed as per this okay and you have a third population w1 to wn they are also normally distributed and in this case uh, the mean is mu1 plus mu2 so i know that the distribution of w will be somewhere down i'll add these two i get mu1 plus mu2 and it is centered on that okay so there are n variables here n here and n over here it says that they all have a common variance so let me write that variance as sigma square so then this is the distribution okay they all have a uh, common variance and it tells me it tells me that you can assume these all to be independent all the three uh, different random variables to be independent the question is find the maximum likelihood estimator of mu1 and mu2 so i have to find mu hat 1 uh, maximum likelihood and mu hat maximum likelihood for 2 okay and you have to be able to use all these samples in making that determination in making that estimate <coughs> okay so again i think i will just discuss this with you it's a pretty straightforward problem so we have those three steps so we never uh, go away from those three steps our first step is uh, <coughs> find the joint density now here you know that these densities are that these are independent okay so how will you find the joint density so the joint density is going to be f of x1 to xn y1 to yn and then w1 
to Wn and uh, so should be able to just indicate uh, so these are going to be the dummy variables will be x1 y1 w1 given mu1 mu2 and sigma square okay so i want to write it uh, bring the notion of the parameter inside while writing the density so this will be you can write it anything it is visible you can write it as 1 by 2 pi into sigma square so let me put a sigma square over here okay and now it should have been 1 by uh, uh, to, into the number of variables so this is a multivariate density and the uh, size of the random var variable is 3n so it will be 3n by 2 okay into the exponential they all have the same variance so i can write this as minus 1 by 2 sigma square into but the means are different so since the means are different i should be able to write this as summation of x i minus mu 1 so that's not entirely true it's mu 1 let me write that here over the i's plus summation of y i minus mu 2 the whole square over the i's going from 1 to n and you have the third term which is summation of w i minus the mean in this case is mu 1 plus mu 2 so i'll have to subtract out the mean the mean two turns out to be minus mu 1 minus mu 2 the whole square and i'll close the curly brace okay that is the joint density this was step one what was step two in step two we substituted the numerical values and instead of calling it a density we called it a likelihood so all these numbers were substituted but these are now going to be treated as unknown so i'll have a theta and my theta is going to be so let me just erase this my step two consists of calling this as l of mu one comma mu two comma sigma square given all the measurements okay mm, all right so I, I think this one you missed out the curly brace over here which i had drawn okay what is the third step or well we realize that there is an exponent so you can take the lawn of this so if you take the lawn of this let me erase this out okay so uh, you take the ln of this and then you take the derivative with respect to uh, mu1 mu2 and sigma square so remember that your theta over here if i might write it or not theta hat but just the theta over here is equal to mu1 mu2 and sigma square you've been asked to find out only the values of mu1 and mu2 or the maximum likelihood estimate of mu1 and mu2 so then you can take del ln of l by del mu1 and set it equal to 0 del ln of l by del mu2 set it equal to 0 and you solve for mu1 and mu2 okay it turns out that you don't need to do this del ln by del sigma square is equal to zero is not needed okay if you go back to the derivations where you had a very simplistic case uh, you will note that when calculating the maximum likelihood 
estimate of the mean you don't need uh, the value of the variance but when you calculate the maximum likelihood of the variance we needed the um, the mean okay so here you don't need to calculate this um, so I I encourage you to try this out it's fairly straightforward uh, let me move on to the next problem this is problem number nine So these three problems had to do with maximum likelihood. We now start going towards problems where confidence intervals are needed. So I have tried to, you know, I'm, I, I really encourage you to use R to the extent possible so that um, you can uh, start doing serious problems. Otherwise, you know, you'll end up doing problems for the exam, but given any serious thing in real life you should be able to solve it and that has uh, so if you learn some software and by the way I still plan to take my fifth and sixth quizzes as programming quizzes okay so I encourage you it's a freeware download it if you haven't I put three tutorials on R uh, in uh, on Moodle I have also you know put a lot of other information on Moodle I've also uploaded this problem so this is problem 7.9 which I've taken from um, which, which is from of course our textbook by Ross so it says that uh, the PCB concentration of a fish caught in lake in a lake was measured by a technique that is known to result in an error measurement. So the PCP concentration is that of a toxin. And you know, um, as our river bodies or water bodies get polluted, um, fish are known to uh, uptake a lot of this pollution, including heavy metals. And when we consume the fish, uh, we ourselves uh, end up getting those high or lethal, you know, not lethal, but those doses. Uh, and we have to deal with the consequences. So in this case, it is a PCB concentration of a fish that they're trying to measure. And they use a technique that is known to result in an error measurement, okay? And this error measurement is known to be normally distributed with a standard deviation of 0 0.08 ppm or parts per million. Now, suppose the results of 10 independent measurements of this fish are given by these values. So these were those 10 independent measurements. Okay. The first question is to give a 95% confidence interval for the PCB level of this fish. Now, whenever you get a problem of this type, uh, you have to, so we have looked at those six cases and you have to try to figure out in which case does it fit. So uh, if it does not fit, you make an assumption and try to make it fit, okay? Uh, for all the parametrics uh, interval estimates that we have been talking about, we'll, for the most part, assume everything to be normally distributed. Uh, if it doesn't, try to appeal to the central limit theorem and uh, make sure you have enough number of measurements. So in this case, as you see, it is assumed to be normally distributed. So that part is taken care of. We've also been given a standard deviation of 0 0.08 parts per million. So this standard deviation is the standard deviation of the population. How do I know it? Well, they haven't used the word with a sample standard deviation, okay, to begin with. Uh, if they have given me, they have taken 10 independent measurements and, you know, I can calculate the sample standard deviation and see whether it matches with 0 0.08 and it does not. So in this case, I know that uh, this is case one of those six cases. So case one, if you recall, was where the mean was, you had to find an interval estimate for the mean when the variance was known, the population variance was known, okay? Uh, maybe I can just try to discuss on the board as uh, 
so please recall case one was when you're trying to find out an inter confidence interval for mu when sigma square is known okay and let me write this as a hundred into one minus alpha percent confidence interval in which case uh, you could say that mu belongs to and we've done this derivation please go back and look it up so if sigma if x bar so you have those 10 different measurements of the fish you can calculate x bar from there okay then the confidence interval in this case one is x bar minus z of alpha by 2 into sigma by root n Remember that sigma over here is 0 0.08 parts per million. Okay. And the upper limit of this confidence interval is x bar plus z of alpha by 2 into sigma by root n. Okay. So, you know, here is the thing that even if you use a software, you have to, you know, to be able to use it, um, you have to be able to know the underlying theory to be able to use it effectively else it's just like a black box okay so i will go over here at the first step so you know i've, I've put enough uh, comments for you to see so the first step i have entered those 10 different values and called put them in a vector or an array x so these are those 10 independent measurements of the fish okay pcb measurement there's a very nice command in r called summary it apply, it applies to almost everything any variable you can put a summary and it gives you some information about that data set okay uh, i have used c so c stands for create so you would say create and then you put the vector array inside uh, you know you can also read off um, data sets from the internet you can read from a file and my tutorial talks about it is not my tutorial, I picked it up from the web, but that tutorial uh, talks about, uh, about how to do this, okay? So it is good to be able to develop some facility with it. So I'm calling this variable summary as sum, and we will look at it. So maybe I can just run it as we go along. So if I put run, it will just look at the, uh, run the highlighted uh, statements. So you can see that these were those numbers, that is x as given to us here, and the summary produces this output. So it says that the minimum value is 10.1. The first quartile is 10.85. So remember what is the first quartile? The first quartile was that the probability on the left of that quartile number is 25%. The median is 11.4. So the probability, and of course, these, these are all using samples and not a probability uh, distribution. So when I say first quartile, it should be a first quartile of the sample. When I say the median, I should talk about the sample median. It is 11.4. The third quartile means 75% on the left of that quartile number is 11.48. Uh, Again, to be precise, I should say sample third quartile oh i missed it the sample third quartile is 12.35 and the maximum value you have is 12.5 so if you look at the range the minimum value of pcb that you had was 10.1 and the maximum value was 12.5 okay now you've been asked to calculate a 95% uh, confidence interval yeah here we go it's a 95% confidence interval so you know that alpha is 0.05 Okay, and as shown on the board, uh, I will have to find out the value of Z of uh, 0 0.025 because it is Z of alpha by 2. Um, so let's define alpha. And this is sigma, which is the population standard deviation. You can use these print commands and so on. Then the command for finding of the mean, although you know from here that the summary already summarized the mean for you, uh, but you have a command called mean, standard deviation, SD, variance is VAR. So it's very, very intuitive. If you've used uh, statistical tools on 
on any software, you know, these are very similar. The number of data points n is the length of that uh, array, which is length of x. Okay, so let's try to run this. If I run it, um, I get, was there anything on the top? Yeah, so this is a variable I've entered. You are free to use equal, okay, instead of this assigned. So you can say sigma is equal to 0.08. Uh, so it says the population standard deviation is given as 0.08. And then in order to calculate, I need X bar, as I showed you, discussed on the board, and the S bar had turned out to be uh, 11.48, okay, X bar, and the standard deviation had turned out to be 0.864, if you would like. Uh, the number of uh, samples, so n I have not printed out, is 10. So you have 10 data points that we have entered. Okay, so now we have to only find out or do that calculation. So the most important thing in that calculation, which you have to be able to uh, know how to do or learn how to do, is to calculate this uh, z of alpha by 2. Okay, so please make sure. I'll discuss with you uh, right now how you could do it. Uh, in R, we have discussed this a few times, uh, but uh, it is important that you also do it from a book. Okay, so for me here, the Z of alpha by 2 is really Z of 0 0.025. Okay, before, you know, let me just finish this R part and then I can go to reading it off the chart in a book. So here is the formula. I've just written it here, x bar plus minus z of alpha by two into sigma by root n, okay? So I calculate this part separately and I just call it the error. It's often known as the margin of error. So I'll just call it as the error. And I have used q norm. So again, go back in terms of thinking, how is this uh, the, the q norm? Uh, so you will re recollect that Q norm actually corresponds to the, uh, let me go back here. So when you use Q norm, okay, uh, by default, it gives you the lower tail probability. So if I tell it, Q norm of, um, of 0 0.025, okay, it will tell me uh, the probability on the left is 0 0.025, okay. Uh, for me, Z of alpha by 2 means that I want this was Z of alpha by 2. That means the probability on the right is 0 0.025. So there are two ways. Either I can tell it that on the left, if this is the probability on the right, then on the left, my probability will, uh, I should give, I should ask it to give me that value where the probability on the left is 1 minus 0 0.025, okay? And then I give the mean and I give the standard deviation and I leave the default, which is the lower dot tail is equal to true. Okay, so this is one way of doing it. You say lower tail probability, which is the default, then it will give you the that number so that on the left side, the total, the left side, the probability is 1 minus 0 0.0 or 1 minus 0 0.025. Okay, this is one way of doing it. Or you give this as 0 0.025 and you say that lower dot tail is equal to false. So in 7.36, when this is encountered again, I have used that, uh, that kind of a, notation okay so uh, you should be clear on that this will not help i should really minimize it and go back to my r window all right so if you want to see this the mean is zero the standard deviation is one okay so what is z of 0 0.025 this is something that you should know without having to look up and we have seen that this number is 1.96.
So you can see just that value. So this is 1.96. If you go back to the board where, where I'd written Z of alpha by two, it is 1.96. And therefore on the left side, it will be minus 1.96, okay? So you can use that. You can multiply that with sigma by root n and then do the, 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 uh, the plus and the minus to give you the confidence interval. So here we have calculated the left confidence limit as x bar minus that, the right confidence limit as x bar plus that. See, this is a two-sided confidence interval. And so we say, and then we've tried to print it. So let me just run this. So what was x bar? It was 11.48. Yeah, I can run it by clicking this. So x bar was 11.48. So the left confidence limit turned out to be 11.43 and the right confidence limit turned out to be 11.53, okay? So there, that, that is how you would be able to solve it. So let me just go back and because you know, for uh, you should be able to read uh, from a, let me make sure I'm projecting the screen. Yes, I am. Uh, so let me go back and open up the table so this is the Z distribution table. Now you have to be extremely careful when using the Z distribution table and they will always specify on the top whether they are using the left tail distribution. They are going to specify the left or the right, okay? So here they're going to specify from minus infinity. So again, if I can use a pencil, Okay, so X is here and they are giving the left side of that distribution. So it corresponds to really the probability, this cumulative probability distribution function. This is the area which is going to be specified in this table. Okay, now an issue of course that you encounter is that uh, in this case, uh, we had, uh, we wanted to find out uh, Z of 0 0.025. Before that, let me just discuss this table. So you have a quantile number that is given to you and it has been given up to two decimals. So for example, if I give you the quantile number 0, 0.0, okay? So this is 0, 0.0. This number becomes with this on the row and this will become 0 0.01. So the, the number over here, if this is 0.1, then this corresponds to the probability on the left side of 0.11. This corresponds to, on the left side of 0.12. This over here corresponds to the left side of 1.02, uh, okay? So these are those X values, and you can read off up to two decimals um, as, uh, as uh, shown in this table. Now you were interested in finding out uh, what is the value for this x being equal to, so for us it was 0 0.025, so z of 0 0.25 uh, means 0 0.025, is that right? 0 0.05, yeah, which is half of 0 0.05. So z of 0 0.025, uh, and this is the probability, okay? So if I'm looking at the left probability, so the probability over here should be 0 0.975 because one minus 0 0.025 will be 0 0.975. So I now have these probabilities inside the table. So I'm going to find out where is 0 0.975. So in attempting to do that, I find out that there is a 0 0.975 five over here. So I go up and I say, okay, it is 1.9 something. The second decimal is on the top. And that something is 1.96. Okay. This is that 1.96. So it tells me that this number Z of 0 0.025 is 1.96. So on the right of 1.96 is 0 0.025. And on the left of uh, 1.96 is 0 0.975.
and you'll see that you were very close when you we had checked that 1.96 and we had got here as 1.959964 which is essentially 1.96 okay so this is how you should be able to read the table so the second question in this problem was to find the 95% lower confidence interval and 95% upper confidence interval. So again, I'll go to the slide where these are given, where these numbers have been provided to you, and you should be able to uh, read them off uh, with the, and you should be able to, you know, not only read them, but you should be able to also um, derive them is what I expect. So when mu when sigma square is known, uh, you have you have this. So this was question A. This is question B. One-sided upper interval and one-sided lower interval is question C. So again, in this case, while we needed Z, Z of 0 0.025, here you will need to find out what is z of 0 0.05 okay and shall we go to the table and try to find it once again so i need to find out that value of uh, x in the table where the probability on the right side is 0 0.05 which means that the probability on the left side is 0 0.95 so let me come, you only 0.8, okay, we are here, 0 0.95 is somewhere here, see, between these two. And this is where I, when I spoke to you in the last class and told you sometimes you would need to interpolate, uh, it is over here. That 0 0.95 lies bang in between of 1.64 and 1.65. And a linear interpolation would be 1.645. So Z of 0 0.05 is 1.645. So the idea of this interpolation is extremely straightforward. Given that you have only discrete data of a continuous distribution, you've been given this number and you've been given this number. The desired number was here, okay? So how do you do? You just think of this as a straight line and you do a linear interpolation, which is reasonable for small increments as in this table. So in this case, because it was symmetric between 0.95 lies right in the middle of 0 0.9495 and 0 0.9505, uh, we know it will be midway between this, so it will be 1.645. Okay. Let's go back to uh, problems. So we have looked at 1, 3, uh, 5, 9, I just discussed with you. Uh, let's look at 11. So I have let uh, x1 to xn plus 1 be a sample from a normal population having an unknown mean and variance 1. Let xn bar be the average of the first n of them. What is the distribution of xn plus 1 minus x bar n? I think I can blow this up. So I think this problem now uses your understanding of probability uh, and connects it to statistics. It's an interesting problem and maybe I'll just discuss this uh, and you can uh, take a shot at it. So it says that you have n plus one samples, not n samples, you have n plus one, x1 to xn and then you have this xn plus one. And these all belong to the normal distribution with an uh, unknown mean, mu, so this is unknown, but its variance is one, okay? Uh, 
Now you know if you were to calculate x bar n, so you should remember what does this in n indicate. The n indicates that you are calculating the sample mean using n data points. And so this we had, we're not using all n plus 1, but we're using only n data points. And so I have i going from 1 to n. Okay, so if your sample mean is defined as such, is the average of the first n of them, then what is the distribution of x n plus 1 minus x bar n? Okay. So if you were live in front of me, I would have loved to listen from you. Okay. You are supposed to, you should be able to answer this question. So as a hint, remember that this is also a normal distribution with mean mu and the standard or the variance being sigma square by n. Okay. And you know that xn plus 1 is also a normal distribution with mean mu and variance being 1. Okay. If I give you two variables, which is x and y, and I tell you both are normal, then what can you tell me about x minus y? We saw this was the magical property which normal variables had, which, for example, if x and y had a uniform distribution, you cannot say x minus y is uniform. In fact, we have shown that it is not. Okay, It is a triangular distribution. But if xn is normal and x bar n is normal, then this is also, this whole thing combined is also normally distributed. Okay, so the first question is, what is the distribution of xn plus 1 minus x bar n? So we have solved this problem in the first part of this course where uh, we have shown that <coughs> any linear transformation of normal random variables is also a normal random variable and you should be able to calculate the mean because you're subtracting it out. The two means will, 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 so you can use the expectation. So expectation of this minus the expectation of this. And so it will become mu minus mu, which is zero. And what will happen to the variance? Now, since x bar n is independent of x n plus 1, because x n plus 1 did not depend on what is the value of x bar n, and x bar n does not depend on x n plus 1. So these two are independent. And so what happens to the variances? They will add up. And so the variance you know will be 1 plus sigma square by n. So if um, you feel that we are using known properties and we haven't really shown that x minus y is normally distributed, I will uh, suggest that you go back to the first part of this course and you see that we have solved these kind of problems. The simplest way to do it is to look at the characteristic or the moment generating function of uh, xn plus 1 moment generating function of this and you can find out the moment generating function of this quantity. You will see that it will have the same moment generating function as that of a Gaussian. And then you can calculate the mean and the uh, variance of that. Okay, so I'm, um, the second part is B is if X bar N is four, give an interval with 90% confidence, given, give an interval that with 90% confidence will contain the value of xn plus 1. Okay, so they are saying if you get a numerical value of x bar n, which is 4, then provide a 90% confidence that will contain uh, the value of, um, if I give, give an interval that with 90% con confidence will contain the value of xn plus 1. So you can give an interval of the mean mu, okay? And they're asking for um, that that interval will contain the value of xn plus one is a question. Not very clear to me. Um, maybe if I, I will look at it and probably upload it on Moodle, a solution. It's the, the question itself is not very clear to me. Uh, let me move on to problem number 13. Uh, problem number 13 says a sample of 20 cigarettes is tested to determine the nicotine content 
and the average value observed was 1.2 milligrams. Okay. Compute a 99% two-sided confidence interval for the mean nicotine content of a cigarette. If it is known that the standard deviation of a cigarette's nicotine content is sigma, which is 0.2. All right, so I'll just discuss this, but this problem is extremely straightforward and very similar to the problem we discussed in case of the fish. So probably you can take a shot at it. So they have given you the following information. You have, you have 20 cigarettes. So this is question number 13. You have 20 cigarettes um, and you want to be able to de determine the nicotine content and the average value. So I will call X as the nicotine content of each cigarette. So the average that they got with the 20 samples was 1.2 milligram. And you are supposed to compute a 99% two-sided confidence interval for the mean. If it is known that the standard deviation of the nicotine content is sigma is 0 0.2 milligram. So this is a case where the, the standard deviation of the population is known. Okay. And so this goes back to being case one and you need a 99% two-sided confidence interval. So the two-sided will therefore be X bar plus minus Z of 99, so 0.005, I think, okay, into sigma by root n. So you have to be able to find out what is Z of 0.005. And you can go to that table and determine its value. Um, let me see if I have it with me. Um, this is problem number 13. It is 2.575, the value that I have. Okay, please check it. My, you know, I'm picking it up from some notes. All right, so you know how to check it. Okay, uh, so that's straightforward. That was problem number 13. So let's go to the next problem, which is problem number 14. And problem number 14 is connected to problem number 13. It says that, suppose that the population variance is not known in advance of the experiment. All right, so this builds up, goes from case one. It says, well, you did not know sigma. You did not know the population variance, which is a more common case, you know. They know, they're very, um, a few situations where you can claim that you know the true population variance but not its mean. So this is the more common case where they do not know but from those 20 samples they have also calculated the sample variance and they have found that the sample variance is 0 0.04 milligrams. Okay. And they want you to compute again a 99% confidence interval. So alpha is equal to 0 0.01 okay 99 percent confidence interval so you know that if you do not have the true this value over here and instead you use the sample value the sample standard deviation then this is no longer a normal distribution but it has a T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So this will be a case where you will be using T of 0 0.005 comma 19. So remember it was T of alpha by 2 comma n minus 1. So there are 19 degrees of freedom over here. And we have very often spoken, we have said that one degree of freedom goes in determining the sample variance or X bar is used and so we reduce it by one degree of freedom. So what you need to know in this particular case is the val is how do you calculate T? Again, in case of uh, MATLAB it, or uh, R, it is straightforward. I really don't have to look at anything, um, but just 
call qt so recall that in r the the distribution would be a qt distribution okay so if i had to find that value i would say qt i hope it gives me help it gave me help so let me true choose my lower tail as false if i choose my lower tail as false i can write this number directly otherwise i have to write one minus of that number so it is 0 0.005 okay uh, comma degrees of freedom is uh, 19 i have that over here ncp is a non centrality parameter we'll, we don't need to state it and we will do lower tail is equal to false okay and this value will so i know that oh you cannot see well let's look at this number and then we can go there so the number i've got is 2.86 okay uh, we had seen that same number for the z distribution i now don't recall what that number is perhaps we had read it off the table so the first point i wanted to make is that t of 0 0.005 comma 19 was 2.86 okay z of 0 0.005 means it is the same as t of 0 0.005 comma infinity okay if you had infinite observations and this is a much narrower distribution so i know that this is going to be less than 2.86 and we calculated it my memory is failing me so i don't recall this number but we have just calculated so it is going to be less than 2.86 okay that is the first point i wanted to make the second point is i wanted to look at a table so that you are comfortable reading it off the table so i come here this was for the z distribution uh, this is chi square this is t so as i discussed with you earlier that for every degree of freedom you have a different probability density function so it is not possible to give so each like the z table is the t distribution when you had infinite degrees of freedom n was approaches infinity uh, which means that so here no we we give a very coarse grained information so um, in this particular case uh, the way that they have given the values is this the degrees of freedom is here okay and the value of alpha u is over here so unlike the table where the x axis of the distribution was given over here and here and the probability was inside here the probability is on the top okay it's just this much so there's very little information because they have given one table for many many degrees of freedom but this is usually enough because most of the times people are trying to find a 95 percent confidence interval or they're trying to find a 90 percent confidence interval or a 99 percent confidence interval and so you'll see that these are most of the times easy to to use so let's come to our problem we want to find out t of 0 0.05 so our alpha by 2 is this value so this is the value that i will read off from and my degrees of freedom is 19 so it is here and so i have this value 2.861 okay so remember again that this table is giving you and and this is not giving you the left tail probability this is giving you probability of this parameter which we have defined as the right tailed probabilities okay so 0 0.05 0 0.005 means that the probability in the right tail is 0 0.005 well see when you go back to reading this distribution the z distribution see that they have not used this is not z of alpha okay in fact this was z of 
1 minus alpha because they are giving you the distribution, the probability from the left end, from minus infinity to that value, to that uh, quantile. Okay, so there is a difference in reading of the Z table and the T table. So please take care of that. Um, so I have 2.861 and that is how you would read it. We had got in R as 2.861, which is, which is very close. So now uh, you should be able to, uh, you should be able to use those values in order to uh, calculate the to calculate this quantity okay all right uh, this was problem number 14 uh, problem number 15 is says that in problem 14 that means this is the problem statement problem 14 you want to uh, compute a value C for which we can assert with 99% confidence that C is larger than the mean nicotine content of a cigarette. So I want you to pay a, uh, you know, special attention to that word assert. Okay? So there are different ways that you can look at this data. One is I have these 20 observations and I can build a confidence interval. Okay? The other way is by making a statement, okay, which is known as an assertion. And this will, we will uh, go in great detail in the next module where we will do hypothesis testing, which is basically where somebody makes a statement and you want to use data to find out if the data is consistent with the statement or not. Okay, so that is something we'll do in, in hypothesis testing in our next uh, uh, module. Okay, which I will upload after finishing my lecture today. So you should get ready with that as well. So in this case, um, they have said that you, they would like you to compute a value C for which you can say with 99% confidence that C is larger than the mean nicotine content. Okay, so here you want, uh, you want an upper bound on mu mu should be less than c and you want to claim this with 99% confidence interval. So note that c is an upper bound on mu. All right. And remember that when we were discussing the lower confidence interval, the one-sided lower confidence interval and the one-sided upper confidence interval, I was always talking about how a lower confidence interval gives you an upper bound okay so it was like this we started off by writing our uh, our statement in terms of probability and then we flipped it in order to find out the confidence interval okay so we have a um, a bound and we want to be able to say that mu with 99% confidence, this is not probability now, it's only a confidence statement, that mu is going to be less than this, we can say with 99% confidence. Okay, so remember that this is nothing but an upper bound and the upper bound is, so the mu is from minus infinity to C, that is your lower confidence interval and this value gives you the upper bound. Okay. So we can go back uh, to seeing what that value was. So this is again uh, case two. And in case two, uh, we, we have seen the one-sided confidence intervals, which was this, okay? So this is the lower confidence interval. That means mu below goes from minus infinity to this. So this term over here gives you that upper bound. So we can say with 99% confidence that mu will be less than this quantity. And note that this quantity is now going to be T of, because it is 0 .00, 0 0.001, okay? comma 19 so again you can go to your table and you will see that alpha just like 0 0.005 was given to us 
also the alpha of 0 0.01 is given to us. So I go back and see this is alpha of 0 0.01 and the value of 19 will correspond to this 2.539. Okay, so that will be T of 0 0.01. So I think you should be able to do that. Let me come back. Uh, maybe I should speed up a bit. I have, there are many more unsolved problems. Maybe, um, um, you know, problem number, this was problem number 15. Uh, then you have uh, problem 16, uh, which let me skip. Uh, it's an interesting problem. It is indeed related to problem number. Uh, it is related to problem number 11. Okay. So it has. No, this is not related to problem number 11. But I'll, I'll leave 16 to you. Okay. Take a shot at it. And we can discuss when we meet for the doubt solving session. Uh, let me go ahead and move to problem number 32. Yeah, so problem 32 was related to problem number 11. Okay. Uh, in problem number uh, 11, you had to find out the distribution of xn plus 1 minus x bar n. Okay, here you have to find out the distribution of not only xn plus 1 minus x bar n, but you had to find out the distribution of the sample variance also. Okay, so it's a very similar problem that you have n plus 1 samples given to you. You have calculated uh, the average using the first n samples and you have to find out the distribution of xn plus 1 minus x bar n divided by sn times the square root of 1 plus 1 by n. Okay. So um, in this case, um, I will, um, in this particular case, uh, you should be able to realize that this is basically a Z distribution divided by the square root of a chi-square distribution with N degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, you should be able to show that this is the equal to the T variable, okay? So, with what I have covered in class, uh, I will leave this for you to show. Uh, there is a part C and a part D. Um, the part C says, give the prediction interval for xn plus 1. So this is very similar to that problem number 11, where you were given, uh, you wanted to find a confidence interval, and which I said I will do with you separately, okay? Or I'll upload the solution key if I can figure it out. Um, it says give the prediction interval for xn plus 1 in this case as well. Okay. Um, let me move forward. I have problem number 36. So problem number 36 is a problem which fits in um, uh, in case of finding out an interval estimate for the population variance. Oh, and I have done this one in R as well, uh, and that is uploaded on Moodle. You can take a look at it. So problem number 36 says that the capacities of 10 batteries were recorded. So you have N is equal to 10. There were batteries, and the capacities are in ampere hours. Estimate the population variance. So they want you to find out sigma square, and I'm assuming it will be uh, Oh, this is estimate the population variance. So what is the point estimate of a population variance? 
A point estimate of the population variance is simply 1 over n minus 1 is a sample variance is uh, x i minus x bar the whole square over okay or you could use the maximum likelihood variance if you state that clearly that you are you are using the maximum likelihood estimator then you could use these these both are point variances this you know is unbiased this one is going to be biased okay part so that was a part b is to compute the 99% two sided confidence interval so this is where you have to compute a confidence interval the 99% confidence interval and the 99% confidence interval is given to you in your in your uh, uh, module uh, this is so we are talking about interval estimates for the variance <coughs> and the 99% confidence interval was given by this okay the two sided confidence interval was given by this so in this case um, you have to be able to find out what is chi square by 2 n minus 1 and chi square 1 minus alpha by 2 n minus 1 degrees of freedom so remember that here they are no longer symmetric so it didn't work like when we were estimating the mean but you need to be able to estimate both these quantile points from the table so let me go to r and open up 7.36 and that is over here so in this case uh, let me see that my desktop is turned no it's not it's okay there you go so in this case um, the problem statement is over here uh, so the capacities in ampere hours of 10 batteries were recorded can compute the population variance so they said you could use the create command to put the to generate the x value you summarize it you have the population variance estimate um, which is simply so this is the sample variance the s square okay so i've called it as s square um, you could compute the x bar the standard deviation and the length of the data uh, the length of the or the number of samples that you have so let me just run this part run there you go so the sample variance which is uh, s square turned out to be 32.23 ampere hours square the sample mean was 144.3 so that was the mean of these data points which were given to you here on the top uh, the standard deviation, which is the square root of the sample variance, the sample standard deviation is 5.68. The length of the data samples which we entered, or the number of data samples we entered is 10. Now, this is what I just showed you in the module 6 handout. These are the two sides of that, uh, of the confidence interval, the two-sided confidence interval. Okay. So, here, uh, you have to be able to find out the chi-square point. Now, the chi-square point in R is extremely straightforward. You have alpha. So, you do Q chi-square, alpha by 2, give the degrees of freedom, and say lower tail is false. So, it is giving you that quantile point. Okay. And for the right confidence limit, you will need this particular value, 1 minus alpha by 2. Uh, comma n minus 1 and lower tail is false so it is giving you the right side probability so if you were to do that you can calculate the right and left side confidence interval um, no i need to run here 
And so while the sample variance was 32 point something, my left confidence limit was 12 is 12.2 and my right confidence limit of the two sided interval here alpha is uh, 99 or this is a 99 percent confidence interval so alpha is 0 0.01 and you can see that the right side is 167.211 so this is definitely not a case where things are symmetric like we're used to so far uh, the sample standard deviation was was um, the point estimate was 32 okay um, but that you can figure out by looking at this formula as well that it is not like in the previous case you had mu x bar plus something and minus something that is not the case you have s square divided by that chi square point and the s square is multiplied by n minus 1 so that it's a chi square uh, variable okay I think that is um, uh, sufficient for us to see. Uh, let me just look at the table. So we have not seen at the chi-square table. Let's go back to the chi-square table. So in this case, uh, I needed. Uh, let's let me look at the. So I needed uh, n was how much? Uh, n was this is problem number thirty-six. So n was ten. And you needed a 99% confidence interval. So you need these two points, chi square. Uh, this is 99. So it is 0 0.0, uh, 0 0.995,9 and chi square 0 0.005,9. OK, so that is. So 9, the chi-square is only a positive. There are no negative numbers here. So it is going to be something like this. OK, so this is uh, on the right is going to be chi-square 0 0.005 comma 9. The degrees of freedom here should be 9. And this will be, so this is 0.5%. And this is 0.5%. So this is going to be chi square 0. The on the right side is going to be 0 0.995. The probability on the right side. The probability on the right side here is 0 0.005. Uh, those values I could have got from R. Let's just look at one of them. So this is going to be chi square of 0 0.005. I just need to evaluate this, so I'll run this. And it turned out to be 23. Let me write this on the board that this was 23.59. And let me find out the other quantile point. And that was 1.735. So this one is 1.735. Uh, now we can also uh, should be able to read this off from a table. So let's look at a chi-square table. So these are this is the chi-square table. Now like T, where there are two arguments, uh, one is the point and the other is the degrees of freedom. So you have uh, like what I drew on the board was a chi-square distribution with nine degrees of freedom. If I draw with 10, it's a different curve, okay? So let's try to look at the first one, chi-square 0 0.005 with nine degrees of freedom. So this is n is here, nine degrees of freedom. And if I draw this line, I can see that 0 0.005 is here. Oh, I, so that that is the value. So 23.589 and the value that I have on the board or from R also was very close to that. The other was chi-square of 0 0.995 and nine degrees of freedom. And that value is this 1.735. And that is what I had written on the board as well. Okay, so this is how you can read off the chi-square table or you can get it from R. Um, 
as uh, the situation may be okay so i have looked at problem number 36 let me look at some more problems so this was case 3 so we've now solved a problem to do with case 3 uh, let's look at a problem from case no, for a problem 38 so i will go to over here let me look at problem 38 Oh, I think uh, I didn't. I forgot to minimize when I was doing the R. So you probably didn't get to see the chi square that I did. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I can just go to chi to the R to just show you what I had done, how I had got those values. So you see, I had calculated it in this particular way. So I used chi square, gave the value of that uh, of the probability of the significance level n minus 1 and I did lower tail is false so I'm finding out the probability on the right side and it gave me a value of 23.589 and when I did this as 1 minus alpha by 2 which is essentially 0.995 it gave me 1.75735 and that is what I had also written on the board which we saw and we saw from the table so I think I missed out then showing you the table as well uh, let me quickly show you that. So here was the chi-square table. So n were the degrees of freedom. So I had come down to 9 uh, or n minus 1. For us, it is 9, the degrees of freedom. When I had alpha by 2 was 0 0.005, then I used this. This gave me 23.589, as we just saw. And when it was 0 0.995, it gave me 1.735. Okay, so this is how you read off the table. And I had drawn that chi-square distribution on the board, and I had written these values. So you can see this is 1.735, and this is 23.59. All right. So the next problem that I was trying to attempt was 38. And um, so these problems are, have to do with two samples, so two populations, okay? So remember case four and case five were two population uh, you know, parameters, the difference in the means. So this appears to be uh, two samples. And in this case, uh, we have uh, population one, the following are independent samples from two normal populations. My Okay, you have sample one or uh, one uh, population, both of which have the same standard deviation. So let's say population X and population Y. Okay, both are normal populations. So X belongs to N mu one comma sigma square, Y belongs to N mu 2 comma sigma square the variances are same they are telling us that the samples obtained here there are 1 2 3 4 5 so i'll say n is equal to 5 and they give you five different samples here the number of samples obtained is 3 okay so you have x1 to x5 you have y1 to y3 so I can write y2 and y3. Okay, those were the three uh, samples that you have obtained. And they want you to find an estimate for sigma. The sigma over here and here are the same. So this is a situation where you have two different populations and you want to find out an estimate of sigma square which is identical using all five samples here and all three samples here 
So if you recall in the last class, we had talked about a pooled estimate. We had two populations. Uh, pooled variance, if I can call it. Okay. And uh, I will show you that when I, so we had seen that SP square was, if these are n over here, when we had n minus 1 times if I call this as S1 square, the variance, the sample variance of these samples, S2 square is the sample variance of over here, then it was this plus M minus 1 into S2 square divided by the degrees of freedom, which was N plus M minus 2. So it's an extremely straightforward problem. Uh, this problem comes under uh, case 5 if I remember, where you had two different populations. Uh, the variances were unknown. Case 4 was when the variances were known. So you had sigma 1 square here, sigma 2 square here, and in case 5 was when the variances were unknown, but you knew that they were identical, so you could pool both of these samples together in order to find a pooled estimate. Okay, And in that case, you could show that the standardized variable or x bar minus y bar has uh, is distributed. This is case 5. So we can show that this is distributed with the with normally with mean being mu 1 minus mu 2 and the variance being sp square. Okay. So you could use this to normalize and then build the confidence intervals for mu1 minus mu2. That is what we had done. Maybe we'll just look at, uh, at our slides to look at that case 5 to just quickly jog our memory. Yeah, so this was sigma1 square, sigma2 square are unknown. and what we had done was was this so we had found out a pooled estimate okay uh, and we had used the logic that if you add two chi square variables with n minus 1 degree of freedom and m minus 1 degree of freedom then the resulting and they are two independent chi square random variables then the addition also results in a chi square random variable with uh, degrees of freedom adding up. So it will become n plus m minus 2. So that was problem number 38. Uh, let's look at problem number 40. I hope I have, no, I, I missed. So you know, I think I should bring it to a close. I'm making a lot of errors. Uh, what I missed showing you was, though I was looking at the slide, I miss showing you that slide. So I was talking to you about this, uh, where you have case five, okay, where sigma one square, sigma and sigma one, the sigma one square, sigma two square are unknowns, but they are equal. And when they are equal, then we can find this pooled uh, variance as I had written on the board, okay? Um, so uh, that is what I had uh, tried to uh, do. All right, uh, let me look at uh, problem number 40. Uh, okay, so problem number 40 is an interpretation problem. I leave it for you to look at, to look at it. It uh, wants you to, um, so it's a case when x1 to xn is a sample from a normal population explain how to obtain a 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval for the population variance sigma square when the population mean is known. Okay. Um, so this is a case where you are finding the confidence interval for the population variance sigma square. And I have already erased that out, but since I have my, let me check whether, yeah, it is, 
So let's go to that is case number three. Interval for sigma square. Yeah. So they're asking you that when you build these population variances, then you had assumed that the, uh, uh, sorry, when you had built this interval for the population variance, you had assumed that you do not know the value of mu. In fact, in building this, you have not used the value of mu. So question 40 says that what if you knew the correct value of the population mean mu, then how would, how would you obtain the confidence interval for sigma square? So you say that mu is known. Under this assumption, what is the what will change over here? Uh, this is a very nice problem. Uh, again, checking fundamentals. So I will uh, suggest uh, that you you can start by doing the standard diagram which I have been following, where you know the underlying. No, that was completely incorrect. Uh, I have to draw a chi-square variable. Okay, and you wanted to find, let us say, a two-sided confidence interval. So you had a lower side and an upper side, and you wrote down that probabilistic statement that the probability of L being less than equal to S square, okay, is less than equal to u is equal to 1 minus alpha okay after this you standardize s square you know that uh, n minus 1 into s square by sigma square gives you the chi square distribution only in this case the mu is known so think about this distribution that if you were to calculate the variance when so you were trying to calculate s square maybe i'll use the board uh, so if you were trying to calculate so you remember that we had been discussing about this uh, we said that n minus 1 into s square by sigma square is a chi-square variable with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, re so recall back as to why did we use n minus 1? Why did we not say n? And you should be able to show that it was because we did not know mean. And so one degree of freedom had gone away in getting an estimate for the mean. In this problem, you know the mean. And when you know the mean, you should be able to show that s square by uh, by sigma square by n is a chi square variable with n degrees of freedom. Okay, so that will be the difference. And by using this information, you should be able to build a confidence interval estimate for sigma in the case when the mean mu is known. So you don't have, take away that degree of freedom because you already knew the value of mean, and so you make use of that. Uh, degree of freedom okay uh, let's quickly go to problem number 42 I think I've been it's been a long uh, lecture um, but uh, so problem 42 so maybe I will not do them but I'll just discuss so problem 42 is an example of uh, where uh, you have it is an example of um, case four where there are two populations given to you and in the two populations uh, you have the mean so you have population x1 to xn 
okay and y1 to yn they have given you x bar they have given you y bar uh, they have also given you s1 and they have given you s2 Uh, they have assumed that sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2. So this is not case 4, this is going to be case 5. And they want you to find out the 99% confidence interval for mu 1 minus mu 2. So this is extremely straightforward. This is case 5. So you will find out the pooled estimate, SP, or the pooled variance, SP square like we discussed in the class and uh, then you should be able to find out what is the 99 percent confidence interval okay just what i just discussed before i erase this out so you know that x bar minus y bar is normally distributed with mu1 minus mu2 and sp square being the pooled variance and you know how to calculate that pooled variance like we just discussed so that was problem number 42. Now problem number 43 is connected to problem number 42 where we will assume that you know the variance. So you don't need to make use of these. So the sigma 1 and sigma 2 are given to you. And these are given to you as as sigma 1 square is 4, sigma 2 square is 5. So this goes into case 4, okay, where you will not use the pooled estimate. You know that these are not equal. So case 5, we had assumed that these two were equal and we had made use of the pooled estimate. In this case, we know that they are not. And so this goes into using case 4. So let me just show you uh, case 4 in the slides because this will be the first time that in the example problems we'll be looking at case 4 so this is case 4 so this sigma 1 square is 4 this sigma 2 square is 5 the number of samples are given to you and you know what is x bar and y bar so you can very uh, easily find out that so this turns out to be a normal distribution so the point you will have to find out is this z of alpha by 2 so it will be z of 0 0.005, okay, which we have also computed before. So that was problem number 43. It belonged to the category of uh, case 4. Next is 49. Okay, so probably this is the last problem I'll look at. In problem 60, 49, we want to estimate p. The, the So this is case 6, which is the variance, uh, sorry, which is the probability of success. So the question is, let me just read out the question. The, to estimate P, the proportion of all newborn babies that are male, the gender of 10,000 newborn babies was noted. If 5,106 of them were male, determine a 90% confidence interval of P. So it's an extremely straightforward problem. So you have XI is the gender of ith newborn. Okay. Now X total is equal to X1 plus X10,000. So I've made this mistake, right? Is 1 if gender of ith newborn is male? and is zero if it is a female, okay? So this is a binomial, this is a Bernoulli variable, so this becomes a binomial variable. And it was seen that the proportion that they obtained was 5,106. So the p hat value, so a specific p hat value, I will call it p hat star to say that it's a numerical value is uh, is 5106, which is th this xt, 
divided by 10,000. Okay, so it is 0 0.5106. Now that is a point estimate. We saw in the beginning of this class that it is an unbiased estimator of P. P is the probability of Xi is P, probability of success. Okay, so you know, you, you generally we see that, you know, it should be 0.5. You know, the equal probability that the child is a, a boy or a girl. So it should be 0.5. But when you took a sample of 10,000, you got a value of 0 0.5106. So you have to be able to give me a confidence interval, which is a 90% confidence interval. And you know this, we, est we uh, made it, we likened it to a normal distribution and we did this z of alpha by 2 into the variance and the variance that we saw was p into 1 minus p by n okay it's only that because we don't know this p we had made this assumption that the variance is known which had allowed us to write it in this way so p star is given to you you can calculate z of 0 0.05 Right, alpha by 2 because alpha over here is 0 0.1 so you can calculate that and you will uh, be able to get the answer I hope I have yes okay so I'm going to leave the last two problems to you to solve them I've discussed in some sense but this was only a discussion you should actually try to solve them I will upload the third, uh, the uh, next module, module seven on hypothesis testing. Um, so please watch out for updates on Moodle. I hope now Moodle is available on the internet and that you're able to access it from wherever you are. So uh, stay safe and uh, I'll see you the next time.